Welcome everyone to our alumni conversations. What no one told us, five universal truths that every woman in STEM should know. NASA astronaut Dr. Janet Epps will interview NASA engineer, Blue Chip Scholar founder, and friend Jessica Newman. Please submit all questions in the chat box and questions will be addressed towards the end of this event. Now, I am so excited to pass it off to Dr. Janet Epps now. I'm uh, Jeanette Epps. I am a NASA astronaut, and um, my background is a little weird. I am a research scientist. I have a PhD in aerospace engineering, and um, you know, STEM is um, at the heart of everything that I do. So, I'm, I'd like to introduce Jessica, and um, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica. Uh, good morning. It is such an honor and a privilege to be able to be here with one of my best friends and to be able to speak um, to the Technofacian Young Women. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, such an honor and such an opportunity to um, get to get to be here and speak to you about some of our experiences. So um, there may be some Technofacian Young Women that know me or recognize me as the founder of Blue Chip Scholars. I also work at NASA and have for uh, the last 14 years. Currently, I'm the systems engineer for um, for building a giant robot that offloads gravity. And I also have a long history of my career starting in the Army, then me working in business, and then finally coming to NASA. But I think it would be interesting to tell the young women how we met. Yes. So it's kind of interesting. Um, Jessica and I met probably almost 12 years ago now. And um, she was my instructor for electrical power systems. And in that class, um, there was something weird about Jessica, <laughs> weird in a good way. Um, she was very, um, she was a great instructor and she was very different from the other ones. And so we had a conversation. I got her talking about uh, some of the things she had done before she came to NASA. And it turns out that we had spent time <laughs> in the same place um, overseas when she was in the army and I was working for the government. And um, we got into a great conversation. But the interesting thing is that we didn't really become friends like we did until um, you trained me for a mission. Yes. Um, so I trained Jeanette for a mission and over the course of that three years, I really got to um, know how amazing she was. And it really wasn't until after that mission that we started hanging out, having coffee and becoming just really great friends. But I think yes. that brings us to, you know, there's five things that we want to tell you that we wish someone had told us before we started our careers in mm -hmm. STEM. Yes. And I think our friendship really brings us to our number one. Yes, supporting other women in STEM. Um, that has grown to be um, very important. I think um, early on in my career, I didn't stress it and I didn't think it was necessary. Um, there were men who helped me, but there were um, there were a few women around me. There weren't many though. So that's the thing. That's probably why I didn't think about it. Um, but there were other women that came behind me that I probably should have reached out to a lot more and um, became a supporter of. Um, so there were a couple of um, points that um, we wanted to make um, on this topic as well. And I think that you know, when you're so busy in your career and, um, of course, in our careers, we've often been, you know, one of very few or the only woman in the room. And um, so there's not necessarily a lot of other women there. And it can feel very competitive when another woman enters the space um, and you can feel like you're in competition with her. And a lot of times... I feel like we're pitted against each other. Like there's one seat that we're attempting to compete for, and that just isn't actually the case. Um, and I, I think that uh, in our current culture, um, at least in the United States, it's very popular to find it entertaining to degrade women or talk 
bad about women or be overly critical about how they dress, what they did, etc. And it's just become part of, you know, our culture that we would um, not support and uplift women. One of the things that I love is that you gave an example of like, um, it was like Kim Kardashian and um, people talking negatively of her, but you had great things to say about her. Like she's a great mom. She's a great business uh, <laughs> business entrepreneur. Yeah. And um, it's interesting because when you started saying these things, um, my mindset and the way that I thought about her changed. And it's the same with other women who enter the group. We're always gonna be, um, we're not always going to be few in numbers when it comes to engineering, but right now there's few. And then you're right. When another one comes in, I didn't realize how um, it made me feel. And, you know, changing the way we think about each other is the beginning of that. And that's how yes. you support each other. Instead of thinking about the negative, there's always something positive that you can think of. And I, I did notice that my mindset has changed a great deal, especially when you you read tabloids or you see some pop up and some negative news about an individual, it could be Britney Spears even. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the way that we think about them has to change. The way we think about each other has to change also. I've also noticed over the last few years that what I say really impacts my thinking and my brain. And so even if it's just someone on TV, um, what I'm saying about that woman impacts my viewpoint of women overall. And that negativity brings negativity to myself of how I view myself and how I view other women. And I have small children and I notice that they react to that also. And when I talk about the good qualities of women, they start uplifting women and they start viewing them as uh, role models and who they want to model themselves after. And they start looking at them as leaders and innovators rather than someone that they should have a negative viewpoint about. Yeah. And, and so you really are changing, you're really changing the way their education socially is, is, is occurring because I think it's natural to just let people say negative things about women, even mm -hmm. though you know, majority of the time, there's um, there's not a whole lot of foundation in it. And, you know, there's always good things, like another person, another female enters the group. You know, they're brilliant. They got there because they're smart. Um, they contribute a great deal. And rather than making them a uh, competitor, <laughs> we we should make, we should um, reach out to be more of a supporter. And, um, you know, I, I have to thank you for helping me to think about, um, uh, you know, other individuals who didn't do that for me. And, you know, I was really down on some people who um, I felt like um, were not supporters. In fact, they were more on the other opposite end of the spectrum, not supporting, but hindering. And so understanding why they may do that and, um, and not um, reacting to it is important. So I think that it's also good for us to view the history of women in STEM and realizing that when we began our careers, um, it was a very different climate where it was, it was a climate where women were pitted against each other and expected to fight with each other for a spot. And understanding that especially, you know, women who've been in STEM for a long time, may not have made that evolution and that their behavior could be part of that um, is also a good understanding. So um, I think that that brings us, uh, well, I just want to say one more thing about that. And that is all of the amazing women that have helped me get to where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, and the job I'm currently in, I was recommended for by a woman. Uh, the job I had before that, uh, I was recommended for by a woman. Um, and if you're taking notes on this, I would say the, the takeaway here is there are so many doors that will open when women support women. I would concur. Yeah. All over the world. Yeah. I think that's an important um, issue that 
um, I think over time is going to change as we start seeing more and more um, women in the workforce and more and more women in science and uh, corporate boards. So then the next um, thing that we wanted to kind of go so into. So our number two, for those of you that are counting the five, is women's rights are human rights. And over coffee, you and I have had many conversations <laughs> about this. Yes. And so um, we should talk about how we um, came up with this. And, um, you know, one of the things we talked about in writing down just some brainstorming notes is that, you know, um, people always ask me, you know, you didn't see anyone look, who looked like you who wanted to do this. So what made you want to do this? My answer was, well, why not me? It's something that I desired and something that I wanted. But you also made me see that, um, Jessica, that, you know, me being female, me being brown, um, wanting to do these things is not a female thing or a brown thing or a male thing. It's a human right to want these things. And so why should I be ex excluded from something that is a human right? And so that it's, it's really important for me to think about it that way. It changed, it completely changed the way I think about things, especially when people try to exclude you from things. It's like, well, I have a human right to this. And making that statement separates the gender, separates the race, separates everything from it. It's um, at, at its core and at, at its foundation, it's a human right. And I, I think that's um, become very important to me. And, you know, I, I do want to know what young women think of that comment because it's a whole different way of thinking about things rather than thinking um, in terms of male and female. Um, it's very different. So I, I kind of, I don't know if there's any comments on that. Um, I would love to know the opinion of, the, of some of the young ladies in the audience, if you have any. So I truly believe that it's every human's right to pursue their idea, to pursue their agenda, um, and that they have, that every human has an equal right to pursue all of the opportunities that this world has to offer. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily how I was raised, but I do believe that this is a universal truth. Yeah. No, I would definitely agree with that. Um, you know, it's, um, I guess in this country, we do tend to think in terms of gender, race, and things like that, rather than human rights. And so getting um, young women and, and people in general to think about things in terms of just basic human rights is, is a challenge, and it's, it's, it is different. And so, you know, understanding that um, the pursuit of, of any any um like a corporate board, engineering degree, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, arts, all of it is a human right. It's not, um, and women should be equally included. Um, we always talk about diversity also, but it's not just diversity of race and gender, but of thoughts, experiences. And when we start thinking more holistically in human rights, I think um, solutions and ideals will just flourish. So I don't think we've gotten any comments on that. And so, yeah, the question of why not me really um, kind of, um, uh, when and it comes to human rights, really resonated with me. And um, I've, I've certainly been asked over the course of my career, you know, why should you be allowed to do that um, just as you have? Um, but yes, women's rights are human rights. And it's at that point that we start viewing, um, do you belong in the room? Do you belong at the table? What is your station? What is your place? You have that human right. And it's taken me so many years to feel comfortable in that, that when I walk into the room, it isn't a matter of if someone thinks I belong. I was born with that right. Definitely agree. Okay. Oh, so I see um, one young lady wrote, yes, I agree. Access and opportunities are a human right. It shouldn't matter what my gender is. I totally agree with that. Um, it, it, and if you really think about it, it is a different way of thinking. And it was um, 
when we've had that discussion, it really changed the way I think about everything. And even though the I pursued things with all my heart and I pursued everything that I, I wanted. Um, and, and it's funny because people would say, well, you're pursuing things that are boy things. I'm like, well, now I know it's not a boy thing. It's, it's a human right. If it's something that I desire in my heart and it's something I really want to pursue with passion, I have that right to do that. So you and I have been working in STEM for many, many, many years. Um, and one of the things that uh, we wanted to put in our top five was a little bit about um, the, the need for uh, technical proficiency and what it takes to uh, be good in STEM. So one of the things that <clears throat> and when I talk to young ladies, I always tell them, um, you know, well, let me start with this example. Um, back in 2014, a young lady approached me at a conference and she said, you know, I really would like to pursue aerospace engineering, but I'm just not sure. I said, well, why don't you do it? I said, it's gonna take a lot of work and consistency over time, but with the time that you put in and the effort, everything that's hard all of a sudden becomes easier. And um, so that was 2014. I ran into this young lady again in Iowa in 2019. And um, turns out she said, you don't remember me, but you encouraged me to go on for and pursue aerospace engineering. And um, I put in the time, I put in the work, and um, I'm here in Iowa working for aerospace, um, Collins Aerospace. And so that story kind of um, resonated with me because she didn't know what to do. She thought that I just woke up one morning, boom, I was an aerospace engineer. But, you know, kind of telling her that a, a lot of work and effort and consistency over time will help you understand. Um, it'll make things that were once hard easy. And so for me, when we talk about technical proficiency, um, it was um, it was in talking to that young lady, I realized that understanding how much work and how much effort and time you have to put in and rolling up your sleeves and just getting started and just continually and consistently over time working at a topic, you'll get there. And that's how you get your technical proficiency. And so we we um we talk about like especially as you raise up in the ranks, you have to have the technical merit. If you don't have merit, then you know that what comes next, the political savvy is what's needed. But for now, you know honing and sharpening those technical skills in your early career is, is everything and crucial. So we talked earlier about um, training you and your, uh, your teammates for a mission. And I've been training uh, soldiers, business people, and astronauts for over 20 years. And just to support your point of STEM is hard for everyone. There are there, there isn't an astronaut in the core that STEM isn't hard for. And even when we get um, at NASA, these very qualified um, astronaut candidates, it still takes us years before we can get them ready to be able to fly a mission because space flight is complicated. It's hard. <laughs> it takes many hours over many years of work to even be able to train um, someone who has already had several successful careers for a flight. And I haven't had a single astronaut come into uh, a flow for a, a mission that didn't struggle with something. They all struggle in different areas. And then there's also areas that every single one of them struggle in because it's just that hard. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's our number three. STEM is hard for everyone. Yeah, everyone. No and it takes everyone. many hours uh, over many, many years to become good at it. But that's what is required yeah. to work in STEM. Yes. Well, and there, there are geniuses in the world, but that percentage is so low. So everyone works hard, everyone. And putting the time in and consistency over many years is what will win the day. 
And yeah, I know it sounds simplistic, but um, I'm always surprised that, um, you know, I meet young women who think that, you know, it just automatically came to me and it was just so easy. Well, and I always want to stress to them that my parents weren't scientists or engineers. And so I really had to find mentors. I had to ask questions. I had to spend a lot of time in understanding and, and making things that were once hard very easy. So, yeah, I didn't come from an engineering or science uh, family either. And um, so it was certainly a learning curve to realize the difference between a liberal arts education and a STEM education, yes. the number of extra hours and efforts that it really takes to become proficient and competent in the field. Okay. Okay. And that kind of leads us into so that takes us to our number four, which is a really good one, also. Well, you know, it's interesting because in my career, um, you'll see that it wasn't the typical aerospace engineer. Um, once I, you know, while in in graduate school, I went from physics and undergrad to aerospace engineering, and um, that was a calculated risk because I was going from a bachelor's to a master's and a PhD. So there were things that I had to do in order. You know, physics was a great foundation for engineering. Um, but then when I left graduate school, I went on to work for Ford Motor Company. Many people thought that I would go work for like Bell Helicopters or, or another aerospace company, but I took a calculated risk and um, Ford Motor Company was very good for, for me, um, especially at that time. Um, but then after working for Ford Motor Company for a couple of years, I had to make a decision, do I go work for the CIA or do I stay at Ford Motor Company? And for me, it was a calculated risk to take. And um, I'm, yeah, I, I've not regretted any of the calculated risk that I took. So I think in your career, taking calculated risks are um, extremely, extremely important. And um, moving from different places um, and gaining all these new experiences as a, and you really start honing and sharpening your technical skills in that way as well. So take calculated risks is, um, it, it's um, extremely important. Um, one of the big things that it helped me do um, in taking these risks was it grew, um, it, it helped me grow my technical capabilities. And I learned so many new things. I learned a lot about myself as well. So. Um, yes. So every day when we wake up in the morning, we start making risk trades. Um, and some of the choices that we make are going to work out the way we want them to work out. And some of them aren't. And it could be uh, part of our decision making process or something that we did or it could be from factors completely outside of our control. Mm -hmm. But you know, obviously I've taken a lot of risk in my life. I was, um, you know, I, I started out my career as a soldier and um, risk and risk trades are just a part of my life. I personally have become very comfortable with making risk trades. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly something that is learned and neither one of us woke up and became comfortable with making risk trades. And part of that comfort comes, I believe, from making a risk trade and it not working out and having a failure. And then how I was able to learn how to respond to failure or rejection. So that leads into like the final one. Um, you know, mistakes are gonna be made and how you handle them is um, everything. Um, being proactive and not reactive to a failure is is the key. And the reason I say that is because the failure can be used as an opportunity. Um, you know, I worked for Ford Motor Company. I was talking about how many Ford Motor Companies there were before there was the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford fell many, many times until he got to the one company that is super famous now. And so with every failure, though, he learned from it and he grew. And um, I think um, many people, um, you know, some people don't recover if there's a failure. 
um, some people don't keep going and continuing on. Um, it, it, part of it is how do you handle the failure? If you're proactive rather than just reactive, I think you'll win the day. It's, it's absolutely true. And I just want to repeat that one more time, another way. Um, in training astronauts and also in training flight controllers, one of the things that we look for is how they react whenever whenever they fail. You know, we can we can create a simulation yes. where there's a failure that you have to respond to. Yes. But when we're able to create a simulation and you make the mistake in the simulation and have to recover from it, then we really get to see um, the the problem solving of that particular person and that. That ability is what makes people want to give you increasing responsibility to make a risk trade, have a failure, make more risk trades, and continue making decisions and climbing. Yeah, you're still thinking. You don't let the failure stop you in your tracks. And you, you don't melt down. You, um, you pick yourself up. You keep going. You figure out what went wrong, and you fix it. And sometimes that's just rejection of yes. someone rejecting you from doing that. And I think that as women in STEM over the years, you yeah. and I have gotten to deal with a lot of that. I would say to this day, it still physically hurts to be rejected specifically when you know it isn't based off of anything to do with your technical competence. It's just a rejection over other issues that that particular person or that organization has. Yeah. Um, but being able to keep going is one of the things that I admire about you so much is one little thing is just a bump for you that would be, you know, crushing to someone else. And I've just always been so impressed with how you're able to um, take, take a bump in the road and just make it... Um, but that's, continue that's, on. That's kind of you, but I think um, I think with most people, and I think most successful people, understanding who you are when things like this come along, when um, rejection or failure, and um, understanding what you've done also, and how um, you've overcome so many different things and all the work that you already accomplished, one bump in the road isn't going to take any of that away. And that's um that's important to me. Like a failure, one bump in the road doesn't take away from everything that you've already done. And holding on to that and moving past that point, and um, you know, in some sense, taking a higher road and um, being proactive rather than reactive is another very important thing. Key to that. The techniques that you've taught me in doing that, I think, are super valuable. Um, I think that brings us to our number five of uh, knowing who you are and who your support system is. Yes. And taking the time um, to build your team. Yes. And building your team is, um, includes having women that you support and that support you. And because when you have that support system, when things go wrong, you can have a conversation with that person and that'll help bring you back to understanding, hey, look, Jessica, you've accomplished all these great things. Um, this is one small bump in the road and here's probably why this happened. And you can have this conversation of support and um, not just support, but um, changing your viewpoint about a, a situation that could happen. And you know that's one of the things you really, you helped me with, Jessica. In a lot of ways, um, you know things happen, and you know it can cloud your the way you think. But having a strong support system, someone who knows you, um, it could be your family member, someone who you can really rely upon to tell you the truth and give you good constructive criticism when you need it, and you know you never feel. So like when you tell me things, I never feel like, ah, oh, really, um, I'm disappointed that Jessica feels that way about me. No, whatever you say about me, because I trust you, I know it's true. 
And I, I know that I can take that piece of information and improve and become better because of it. And so having that support system is everything because you can, I, I think um, there's always gonna be things that happen. And if you don't have the right support um, system, you, you can't necessarily, you likely will not move ahead and forward and higher. Um, having that support system just helps you raise um, to higher and higher levels. I think early in my career, not coming from a family or a community that had any background in STEM, um, my natural support system, the friends and family and community, um, didn't have that STEM perspective. And I think that it took me, you know, you, you know, when you get into a STEM career, you're concentrated on the technical and you have to be, but you also have to be concentrating on building your team and your STEM support system team and um, realizing that there's only going to be, you know, that you're going to have to expand your team and your support system past uh, where you came from um, to be able to build careers like we've built. Yeah. And okay. I think that if I had to go back and tell myself, I would certainly tell myself to start building that team yes. and those relationships and that support system sooner. Yes. And, and you're right. Um, it's interesting because I consider um, uh, my professors from undergrad and graduate school a part of that system. Um, you know, since I've joined NASA and worked in uh, in government and at Ford, I've reached back to them so many times and they have supported me through so many different things. But one of um, the things that I value the most are the close friendships that I build with um, like-minded women. Because there are things that you'll go through um, that only certain people will understand. And um, so having a good support uh, system it has been everything throughout my entire career, um, making people mentors and then building that friendship and that relationship is um, also another way to do that. Mentorship is so important. And, um, you know, yes. sometimes those mentors are assigned to you yes. and sometimes they just happen. Yeah. And sometimes they happen um, with your peers um, and yeah. sometimes it happens with um, your friends, yeah. um, but being able to uh, know who you are also, it helps to have that support system there to remind you to remember who you are. Yes, remember who you are. That's, um, that was one of my favorite scenes, remember who you are and what you've done. And um, that support system um, is always there to help you remember that. And um, not just remember that, but um, you know, there's going to be um, so much. Um, you'll have times when you're heads down and you're working hard, and you'll need that person to come along and say, "Hey, you know, take a break, um, clear your brain, and then go back to work." I've had um, my twin sister was a source of that for me, and my mom at the time, and all of these little things that um, helped me through my my uh, graduate school, and then. My, now my 20 year career. So um, I can't stress enough finding a mentor, not having a mentor assigned to you. And sometimes an assigned mentor can be great, but in general, if you find someone who's like minded, who um, not necessarily exactly like minded, because you want someone who's going to give you good constructive criticism and add, um, finding that, that one person that works and clicks is, is crucial. I think her. Yeah. So for anyone that came in late, I think that we should just go over and say our five again. Yeah. So our number one was talking about all of the doors that open when women support women. Our number two, women's rights are human rights. And I don't think we can say that enough that women's rights are human rights. And as humans, we all have the right to pursue our idea, our, our agenda, um, and 
take those opportunities that the world has to offer. Number three, STEM is hard for everyone. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter what family you come from, where you're born. STEM is hard for everyone, and it's 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 a good field because it equalizes the playing field because it is hard for everyone. Yeah. Number four, take calculated risk. Everything is a risk trade. And number five, build your team and your support system. Yes. So with that, we would love to take some questions. I enjoyed this conversation a lot, and now I will read some of the questions in the chat. Marina is saying, incredible insight. Now, I am curious to know, what is Blue Chip Scholar Initiative? Oh, yes. So Blue Chip Scholars um, is a program that I founded it to link up women like Jeanette with young women that are interested in whichever field um, the woman in STEM is working in. So it's a community of support, of mentorship and collaboration of young women interested in STEM um, and leadership. Um, and if you want to know more about it, you can go to bluechipscholars.com. And the next question is, if not confidential, would Dr. Epps share about a concrete failure and how did she handle the with it? Well, um, there's, um, yeah, I'm wondering if I should talk about this. Well, it wasn't necessarily a failure on my part, but um, so I was training for a mission with Jessica and um, then all of a sudden the, the mission changed and I was removed from that. And that felt like a failure to me. But the way that, um, some of the things that we talked about today on um, knowing who you are and understanding all the work that you've done has played a key role in getting past all of that. And that's why, you know, one of the things, you know, I'm still here working, working on a new mission with Boeing. Um, and so there's the way that I handled that was I didn't react to anything. I told the truth. I remembered who I was. I had good friends who um, backed me up on, yeah, Jeanette, you did this, you did that, you did this. Um, we're, we're in agreement with you. And having that support system got me through it completely. So there was a couple of things that we talked about today that um, I leaned on. Um, my support system, Jessica was a big part of that. Um, knowing who you are and taking the risk and, and standing up for yourself and stating that, hey, look, I have a right to this. This is not, this is a human right, um, was a big way that helped me with, through this whole thing. So a lot of the things we're talking about today came out of experiences that we've had and, and how our lives are better for some of the things that we've learned. And the support system that I had was crucial. It was absolutely crucial. And if I could add to that, one thing that Jeanette is so good about is um, being able to comfortably demand to be righted. And sometimes when our rights are violated, we have to be able to say, no, this is wrong. And this is what needs to happen to make it right. Yeah. And that takes, that takes a lot of courage. It's certainly a very, very scary thing to do. And I think all of us have had to do that at one time, but being able to just, like she's just amazing at being able to know who she is and being able to demand to be righted. And thank you, I appreciate that. But you're, you're also um, one of these people, very calm, never reactive, but very proactive in how you approach a situation. Because if you, you know, react to everything, man, you're, I mean, people are controlling you through, <laughs> through that way. But if you're proactive, you're controlling the situation more than um, allowing other people to just use you as a puppet. <laughs> and so um, I do appreciate that comment. But these are a lot of, um, these, some of the things we said, this is, I think, why we became such good friends. I think we're similar in that way, even though we're different, but we're very similar in a lot of ways. That sounds great. Our next question is, how do you build confidence to be in a STEM-based class or career that is heavily male-dominated? 
consistency, working hard. <laughs> well, like we were saying, everything that you don't know is hard until you learn it. You put the time and effort in. And then when you're, um, so I wasn't comfortable on my skin until I left graduate school and I started working. Um, and that um, realizing that I learned a ton in graduate school, I can go out into the world and apply it to anything. Um, that built my confidence and knowing my, knowing my topic and knowing my subject. And it gave me so much confidence that when I didn't know the answer, I could admit it. And that's when you know that you truly have um, arrived is that, well, I don't know the answer to that, but I will look into it. And being able to say that comfortably rather than just saying anything. <laughs> so it, it's the hard work. It, it's the technical, it the number is. three on ours. Yeah. It's number three and number four. It's taking one risk at a time, yeah. just taking that risk and dealing with the aftermath of it, whether that be success or failure. Yeah. Um, I think in the world today, there's a lot of talk about work-life balance, and certainly you need work-life balance. Um, but with the work, there truly is a lot of work, um, and you just you just keep barreling through. Consistency over time, consistently working that topic. And uh, you know, as you as, as you chip away at it, all these things that were so hard at one point in time become very easy. And so everything's hard until you learn it. And and once you once you've done that and any male dominant um, group, I mean I think um when I graduated I was the only female. Um, but there were other female in my group, but we, there were probably three out of almost 20 some odd people. So you're always gonna be, um, the, I'm, I'm gonna stop saying, you're not always gonna be the fewest in number when it comes to females. But when you start thinking of yourself as just one of the members of this group and stop separating yourself, and this, is, this goes back to human rights, and you're doing the same work, you're working hard, you're accomplishing things just like any guy in the group. That should build your confidence too. And it's your right, human right. So one thing that um, is fun for me as an instructor, as a teacher, is watching how the human brain works and how people learn. And the, the really amazing thing about the human brain is the more you learn and the more you do, the more you're able to learn. You would think that there would be a limit or a cap but it's actually very knowledgeable people that are the easiest to teach because they have already all of those neuro connections ready to learn the next thing. So it truly is a, a multiplying exponentially process whenever you start learning STEM. So it's, yeah. it's, it's one risk at a time. So our next question is risk risking taking some soft okay. What are some good ways to learn how to take how to take calculated risks? Well, I will tell you, like I've changed my career, <laughs> it seems so many times. And um, you know, for me, one of the biggest things was um like when I left um working for the government to come to NASA as an astronaut, um, I knew that it was gonna be a huge challenge because I'm completely changing my career. I have so many new things to learn, like learning to fly a jet, learning how to operate the robotic arm, learning about spacewalks, learning Russian language, and accepting that challenge ahead of time and knowing that as I come into this new life, I've got work to do. And so to me, um, when I looked at the risk of leaving a great position that I was already in, to really change my whole career and my and you're learning all over again. Um, the thing that I did was accept the challenge ahead of time. And so when I came on board, I knew that there wasn't gonna be anything that I couldn't do without putting, you know, if I put the time and effort and work in, I can accomplish it all. And I was ready for it. And so being ready for that um, change and that challenge was the big thing for me. And you know, people say, well, is it risky to leave government agency to go to or work as an astronaut? It could be. Um, there's a lot that goes into um, becoming an astronaut and accepting the challenge and the risks that you'll take in getting on a rocket and blasting off. So um, 
accepting the risk ahead of time and understanding what it is, is, is crucial. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, I was just thinking back to when I was 18 years old and I was in my first army training and um, it, I was being trained to be an officer to go and fight in combat. And so certainly that is something, no matter who you are, that can be very scary. And I remember how the army trained us as army officers was that courage is doing what you're afraid of. And that is what I've used when making risk trades uh, throughout my entire career is understanding that it's supposed to be scary and it's courage that allows you to go and take that risk even though it's scary. So the answer is you just do it. And the more you do it, the more courage you build. However, I will tell you, it doesn't really get less scary. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, I've trained a lot of soldiers and a lot of astronauts. They're still scared but they've just built this courage because they've taken so many risks and made so many calculated risk trades over the years. They know that once they just step forward, that that courage is just a matter of doing what you're afraid of. Yeah, there was a thing someone recently said that you can't be brave without fear. And so, um, I, I agree. Um, it, it gets easier over time because you have more experience and more knowledge. But you know, initially being so young and taking a, uh, you know, going into combat and things like that is not easy. It's not easy making that um, risk trade. But um, taking risks. Um, when I say that, like leaving um, Ford Motor Company to go work for the government, I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was at the time because I didn't know exactly what I was going into. And it wasn't until I, I got on board that I understood um, what I would do. But I did have to look at, okay, I'm, I was living in Michigan. Uh, okay, I, I'd have to move back to the Maryland, Virginia, D.C. area. That was a big plus. I'd be learning something totally new. Um, and, you know, with my engineering degree as the foundation, but still, every time you move to a new job, you're learning something totally new. Will I fit in? Will I understand the culture of that organization? Um, how to do that? There's a lot of reasons. Um, and you know, even the salary that you make and where you live, there's a lot of things that go into um, some of these things. Like I had never um, moved to a state where my twin sister didn't live. And I know that doesn't sound like a big risk, but for me initially, that was a big concern. And, but you know, I got to Ford Motor Company and I loved it. I made friends and um, Ford was very good to me. So um, that was a good risk to, to, to up and move from Maryland to Michigan. And so all of these things, I had to think um, about what I was gaining rather than the things that I wasn't really losing, but the things that I was leaving behind. So our next question is, how were you encouraged to get into STEM? I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first. Yeah. Um, so I was a late comer into even the idea of STEM. I was uh, 16 years old before I even considered um, going into STEM. I wasn't raised uh, in, a, in a community or family where it was thought that that was even something that a woman would do. Um, but when I was 16, I had the opportunity to volunteer at a museum, a science museum. Um, and there was an exhibit there called Mission to Mars. And the exhibit was actually run by a Canadian astronaut, uh, Shantar Bradshaw. And I just, it just like this whole world opened up to me of the thought of, I, I started becoming interested in physics. I would check out books out of the library um, about physics, and I just started reading about it. Uh, I wasn't at an academic place where I could even take any of those classes um, because I, my life hadn't been set up for that as a girl. 
um, because of the uh, the community that I came from, that wasn't something that girls were supposed to be doing. So, um, yeah, I was 16 years old and everybody thought I was crazy because I didn't have the math. I hadn't taken the math um, or any of the classes that would be necessary to do it. And so I just went and enrolled in a community college and started with college algebra and just said, I'm doing this. And that's that's how I became interested in STEM. How about you, Jenna? My my story is a little different. Um, so it was my older brother, um, my twin sister and I, we, we loved watching public television um, where you'd watch all these great shows about, I mean, just basic stuff. and but we love math and science. And so he was away at college and one weekend he came home and Janet and I wanted to impress our older brother with our report cards and our great grades. And so, but he looks at him and goes, well, you guys are doing really well in math and science. You know, one day maybe you can become an astronaut or maybe even an aerospace engineer. And my nine-year-old brain was like, well, they'll never pick me to be an astronaut, but I can definitely become an aerospace engineer. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I said, that's what I'm gonna be. And as something clicked in my brain, and from that point on, you know, I ended up going into physics because my undergrad being a Jesuit school didn't have these separate um, uh, engineering schools. And so they said, well, you can come here for physics and then go on into engineering. Um, and that's what I did. And so I, I just, it just stuck with me from nine years old until you know, now. <laughs> so it's a little weird. Uh, my family was very encouraging, very supportive of anything that um, I wanted to do. So. So our next question is from Anika. Uh, what would you, what we, what would you think the world would be like if, if the world would have accepted women's rights a long time ago? Yeah. So and. Um, in every um, community that you go into, um, whenever you educate and lift women up, the entire community is lifted up. There isn't, it isn't possible to lift up women and not lift up children and men and your, your entire community. So, um, you know, I mean, that, that's a really good question. You know, was is there a cure for a disease that a woman would have discovered? Is there some great invention that would solve energy issues that a woman would have discovered? It's it's a really good question. I think it's a great question because really, um, it's not that we they would have to accept women's rights. They have to accept everything. It's a human right um, at the foundation of it. And and if we started treating things as like well, everyone should play in this. Um, you know, we're talking about um, diversity, but, you know, diversity really is just human rights, including everyone in on the conversation. And I think that when you start doing that and you start thinking um, more about human rights and you're including everyone in on the conversation, I think that we will make more advances in the world. I think um, more ideas, better solutions will come out of this because you don't just have um, everyone um, women and men playing. You have people with different experiences, different ideas, um, just different ways of seeing things coming to the table and contributing to these, you know, to um, different projects. I mean, I think in engineering, it can only help um, in various ways. And so I, I think that, um, I think including everyone in on a conversation will only make things, um, it'll make things be better. Um, in, in many, many ways. And, you know, I can't, um, I wish there was a way to kind of um, quantify what could happen, but I think as we, as time goes on, we'll see more and more inclusion and, and we'll see different, a difference in the world. So I think this is the, our last question. If you can go to any planet in the universe, which one, do you want to go and why? Oh, that's easy for me. So, I mean, for me, it would be Mars. Um, and probably because uh, I became interested in STEM 
volunteering for an exhibit called Mission to Mars. And so I learned a lot about Mars. And I think it would be a really cool planet to, oh. to go to. There's so many places I'd love to go. Um, I watch this television show called The Expanse. And like they have Mars, um, people who live in the on Mars and people who live in the belt even, mm -hmm. <laughs> and people who live on the moon and here on Earth. And that, that kind of watching that um, television show kind of makes me want to think that someday we can do that. We'll have people who live on the moon, we'll have people who live in, on Mars itself, but then we have people who are working in the belt, mining for ice so that we could have water and things like that. So for me, I would love to travel around to all these different places, but Mars would be ideal, but even beyond the belt, you know, going, we can't really live on the um, gas giants, but to kind of pass by and visit, maybe visit one of the moons of Jupiter also. So uh, yeah, I, I can't pick, I, I, want, I want to do it all. <laughs> and, and then the answer of why, the answer of why is because it's hard. <laughs> Yeah. Because because it's there, because yeah. that's the human spirit. Exploration, yes. Curiosity. So this brings us to the end. Thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Jenna Tebbs and Jessica A. Newman. If you're interested in learning more, please visit NASA and Blue Chip Scholars websites. Please be sure to take our exit poll and let us know if you learned something from today's workshop. And stay tuned for our next activity, our welcome event for the day. Enjoy the rest of your World Summit, and thank you again for joining. Thank you, Kanda. Thank you so much. Thank you for having thank us. You.